Now, these people are not presenting an academic paper on cultural shock and differences between Africans and the Scots. That's not what they are doing. They are basically telling you common sense and personal experiences of the interplay. Yes. And oh, Dr. Somati, please. I notice, Tracy, that you are shy. Uh, do you think you can help us? Yes. Clap for us. Okay. Um, your basic question is, are there any no-go areas in building a relationship with a Scot? Or what do you notice about Africans which can put you off when they approach you uh, in order to befriend you or bring you the gospel? And then my African brothers and brother and sister, when you came to Scotland at first, what shocks did you have as you tried to approach your Scottish brothers and sisters or go out with the gospel? Now, each of you, you can even speak for a minute and give the, uh, what, the phone to another person, the microphone to another person. And after you have remembered something, you can still come in and speak. It's free for all. But after each has had a session, I will open the flood lines for the, the, those of us on the floor to question them about our major difficulties in crossing the cultural barrier to, to witness to people in Scotland. Well, when I say Scotland, I mean Britain. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Yes. Okay, I did ask a few questions to people, so they've scribbled down a few things. But first of all, I would say there is no problem approaching each other at all, unless you're not used to, you know, mixing with foreign people. Some people in Great Britain have never been out of Great Britain. They've never even been out of their city or their village, and that's it. You know, so they're sort of terrified to speak to people. So one of the biggest things I think that would hold people back would be fear you know and uh, like with African people that are very into tribal things we're not we don't have anything like that you know as far as we're concerned it's um, we're a citizen of heaven you know that's it I am African as far as you're concerned or I'm British I'm whatever you want me to be and the book of Romans says I am all things to all people amen so that's exciting for me but uh, a, f a few different things I wouldn't say they're hindrances but uh, some people said that uh, communication, you know, like sometimes there's a lack of communication to everybody. Some people only tell like the inner circle of the church and they don't tell the rest of the church. So maybe they've missed a meeting or an event because they didn't know about it. They weren't informed about it. And uh, there is a difference in singing. I, myself, when I went to Africa, I didn't know that somebody starts and then you all follow. You know, we're just used to this sort of form of praise and worship. You just put on the song and that's it. So once you get a hang of it, it's not a problem at all. It's just a different thing, like you're saying, for differences. And then another thing that was different is... Um, now I said that one. Uh, when speaking in tribal languages, uh, some people, when you're in the company of other people, some people don't like that because they don't know what, they're, what you're saying and they feel isolated because they're not sure if you're talking about them. <laughs> if you are, well, I wouldn't worry about it because you don't know. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> and then another thing was, uh, oh, praise and worship songs in tribal languages. Don't know what you're actually saying. But myself, when I went to the Apostolic Church for 11 years, what we did is we had Oshi Baba and all that. We had it in English and in African, so we knew what we were singing. You know, thank you, Daddy. Thank you, Father. So that would be a way around that one. 
but I don't know if other churches do that. Uh, also, uh, yeah, there's church issues, they said, sometimes in the Pentecostal ones, when they're speaking in tongues and laying on, on of hands, they explain what it actually is, and some places don't. So, again, that's a lot to do with the church, I think, individually, because some people are into that and some churches are not into that. So, again, that's individual. And one example was in a place called the Faith Clinic. You know, that's people that come on drugs or drink. Oops. And what they do is they give them a, a Bible and the people can't even read or write. Never mind, you know, know what the Bible is. So they were saying instead of that, they could maybe give them, but ask first, do you read or write? And they could give them MP3 players, you know, so they could listen to the word and that way they could learn the word instead of worrying about reading it. And of course, there is a lot of people, especially nowadays in Britain, they're going to school and they come out of school. I don't know how they manage it. They come out of school and they can't read and write, which is not correct because the teachers are getting paid a lot of money. And plus, we're supposed to have assistance in the class. I don't know if everybody has it. I'm a bit out of, out of touch about that. But it is a shame, you know, if, if people don't read and write. And then uh, another good thing is, like some churches, they explain how you can take the Word of God and apply it to your situation, your problem, and then other ones don't. You know, they just presume that you were brought up, you know, in a Christian family, you know everything, and they just zoom past everything. And if you're new and you're trying to learn, you can't get a grasp of it. And uh, you know how we should learn to speak the word to the situation? So they said some more teaching could be done on that one. And that, that's it, really, that I've heard so far. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. It seems as if you prepared about it, but I didn't know. So I was, taking, I was just taking like that. But it's good because uh, I had some experiences when I came. In where I came from, you can evangelize anytime, anywhere, whether in the bus, going anywhere, you can evangelize. And when I came here first, I, I, I did that first, and it was a shock to me, because it was like you don't have to do that. You must have, keep it to yourself. I actually had an experience in one of the wards in in ARI, where I actually ministered to a patient personally, then prayed, then gave a track. But two days time, I, I was called. The only thing that saved me that day was that there are uh, uh, Gideon Bibles in, in those places, in the lockers, even though they don't read it. So when it came to that critical point that they said, you don't have to share what you you, you believe in to people. You don't have to say it. That was the first shock I had here. So it was when I said there are Gideon Bibles all around and that had to bring down the case lower. So that is one of the shocks I, I had. And you can't feel free. There, I, coming here actually, I thought this was a land of the book. So everybody must have known about Jesus Christ. Then another shock was I ministered to a girl in a nursing home in the evening when we were doing our night shift. She said, I've never heard about Jesus all my life. Nobody ever told me. So that was another shock I had. So to me, there is a hindrance. Yeah, yeah you don't flow freely. You have to pick your words. You have to be some w words that you say which are biblically they can miss they don't know that there are demons you know if somebody is a lesbian and you say that's a spirit they will say what do you mean by spirit it's a lifestyle you know it's a, it's a yeah it's my choice you know if they don't know it's a demon you know that you can deal with so those are some of the barriers that i felt praise the lord um um, with Heather, like, uh, there's not major barriers. I mean, I would say that, um, I mean, the fellowships, African Caribbean <coughs> Fellowship is actually quite good. I kind of think really, but uh, any um, examples with the Caribbean Fellowship, but I actually worship with the, the Redeemed Christian Church of God in Aberdeen. 
and um, even uh, I mean um, like for example worship sometimes it's written like bayeti bayeti noski and people are like what what's that <laughs> you know so they're, they're like we're singing but we don't know what it means so you know they're like, okay so other examples are again laying their hands and tongues praying out demons and they're like demons what are demons in the church of scotland they don't know about the spiritual things it's like the the words kind of diluted yeah they don't allow preaching in tongues i mean i think we have a minister in aberdeen that does speak in tongues but she can't speak in tongues because she would be voted out her church if she was to be so that's um so just explaining what laying of hands are and what speaking in tongues is and um also other examples which are quite funny like i had a women's fellowship meeting and I had my chicken, and they're like, oh, you haven't finished Tracy. They're like, I have. And they're like, no, you haven't at the chicken bones. And I was like, no, <laughs> 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 I haven't. I, 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 it was at one of my uh, my dad's women's fellowship, so things like that, and you know, I know when um, a baby's maybe got a cold that you you put your mouse over the baby to suck out the gut, yeah. <laughs> so like they would say, I I'm cleaning my baby's nose. It's okay, it's okay. <laughs> but you know, certain things like that, you know, we don't do. But it's okay. It's not a problem. But you know just to explain you know so and um, again i actually serve in redeemed in fraserborough so uh, each saturday and sunday i travel an hour to go out and back for missions sometimes saturdays and um, often there's people maybe yorubas and um, and like They'll be saying, oh, yes, yeah, so blah, 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 blah. And it's like they'll talk all the way, all the way in their Europa or Ibo or, and like, you don't know what, what it is. So, like, <laughs> it's like, I, I don't have the gift of interpreting tongues. So it's like. <laughs> That's the only time we talk. It's like, good morning, brother. Hey, Caro. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, good day. Hello, bye. And then, you know, so it's not like you're spending time talking to us. It's like you just pick me up, say hello. I'm in the car for an hour. Then we're out. We do our duties. Then we go back home. You drop me off. And then you say bye. Like, oh, praise God. Bye. So, you know what I mean? We have to talk more. It's not so much. Communicate. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, yeah, we're serving God. From, you know, the Bible says there's no Jew, Jew or Gentile. We are all under the same kingdom. So let's, you know, so. I want to say that there is actually no barrier, really, as far as evangelism is concerned, if you know what you are doing. But when we come from Africa, there are some initial shocks. I mean, I can sum it in what my boss said to me last week. He said, Joe, there's a Nigerian who's come to our, our church. I think she's so trained that she still speaks uh, Elizabethan English. I said, what do you mean by that? Victoria, Victoria, what do you mean by that? I was taking her out, and she saw this woman smoking. She said, that is a vagabond. In Nigeria, only a vagabond smoke. <laughs> you know? I said, what do you mean by that? said, vagabond is not even English, English spoken today, <laughs> you know. But, so, of course, we see women smoking, which you, which you do not see in Africa. We see people drinking in the church, uh, uh, you know. Uh, it's one of the things that we, 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 we see here. And also, we see people's kissing. And uh, kissing all over the place, in the bars, in the street. They do all the mental kissing outside, which is a shock to us when we come, first of all, to see that. And of course, we see also that 
chapels as are sold to uh, for other other purposes, perhaps and things like that. We, we think that this is also a Christian nation. So these are initial shocks that we see when we come here as African. But as far as I, I, I'm sharing this from my own experience, as far as sharing the gospel with them, I think that most of them are, are, are open to listen to you uh, as to what you say. But one of the first barriers we have is communication. You see, most of us who come here are probably coming to study. And so we are used to good grammar. We are used to academic writing. We are used to speaking sometimes passive language. And I went to, and I went out to speak to, and about five people I spoke to, as another person, oh, the English is too high. Can she come down and speak to our, to our level? And, and to me, that, that was a shock. In fact, I had that experience also in Ivory Coast. I went to Ivory Coast, uh, and I began to speak to people. And somebody asked, did I learn my French from books? <laughs> you know, from a textbook. Because the level at which you are speaking is higher than they understand. But I, I couldn't understand it until uh, I went for a plain English course. Because I write a lot of, a lot of guidance for my, in my department. And as a, as, a, as a principal, the Scottish local authorities adopt a plain English uh, campaign. Which means you need to speak in a, in a way that a, class, a, a P6 pupil will understand you. But most of the English that we Africans speak will not qualify as plain language. We speak too high at a higher level. And so when it comes to evangelism, you'll be sure that people don't understand you when you communicate your English language. Because we still speak the, the, the nice Queen English. And so that's one of the barriers to reaching them. So I, 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 I remember that uh, when I went out with a lady in uh, Hetrifle, when I speak the English, first of all, she has to re-speak it again to them in a Scottish language. But I, but I still learn how to speak to them at, at their own level, very simply. Today. So that's one of the barriers uh, to evangelism to uh, people in this land. The other issue, which I should say, is the issue of timing. The Englishman or the Scotsman is, is, is conscious about time. So when they are coming to church, probably they have put... I, I, I have lived in a, with an English home for one year when I was doing my PhD in Oxford. And so I know when we are going to church, I go to church, they put the chicken in the oven and they time it. And before we go to church. So they know they have a, a, a clear understanding of how long the church will stick and when they are going to come home and have their dinner. So when the typical Africans organize their things or we, we start time to preach and we are preaching for one hour, there's a, the people walk out. And I remember even in our church, one of our brothers was preaching. People walk out in anger. Because the preaching even went beyond 15 minutes is the normal time. 15 minutes will be tolerated. But one hour and five minutes was beyond, uh, what do I say? <laughs> beyond long suffering. <laughs> so, so some people actually left the, left, left the church. So that's why we need to look at it. And also, the timing, I mean, Stella and I, uh, went out to minister to people. We planned our time, but we were always going at tea time. So the time we went to knock at the door, which is our having our time, you know. So the timing, uh, we need to understand when they have their own tea time, when family time is important to them. Otherwise, even though they might, even though in that particular case, that, that those family come to Stella to pray for them, they said this is our tea time. They didn't welcome us to. So we need to know that they are, they are, the time that they are available uh, before we go to them. There are other things that we also need to understand. Uh, still, uh, Sister Heather mentioned that already. That is, there's so much ignorance in this society. That is, uh, most people have not even known our Father in heaven. They have never heard it before. Most schools, not, unless you are doing RME, religious, moral, and whatever education in school, you never heard about the Bible and things about the Bible. People have no idea at all, whatsoever, anything, anything in the Bible. It's the same thing in, 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 in South London, when we were in South London. People have never heard anything in the Bible. And so we presume that for God's soul, they, they, don't, they have never heard it. And so we need to go with that assumption that these guys have heard nothing about this. You might see them as a class one student. We preach in Africa to Africans because they have heard a lot about God. If they're not in the, in the buses, in the lorries, we have a lot of Bible verses in the lorries in, in the places in Africa. But we don't have the same thing in this place. So they have no background. So you need to assume that they know nothing about the Bible. 
So you might sometimes go slower. The, the message may, may be given in, sometimes I give the, I give the message in four, four sittings. God's love, the next time we are all sinners, uh, the, the next time Jesus is the way, the next time you have to receive Christ, very slowly for them to understand and, and read the story to understand what you are, you are talking about. Then, for, for those people who have never heard about Christ, it is easiest to reach them to them. Whatever you tell them, they, they listen to you and they go to whatever you tell them. They will speak in tongue the next day. But those who have been church before, they have had a mild dose of Christianity. And so they, they have immunity against the real, the real disease. Do you understand me? The message they heard is so, so low that when you are taking, giving them the real thing, they are, they are completely immune against the gospel. And you need to pray hard for them to come to the God. And you need to be very friendly and slow to them. Uh, one of the things that I, I, I would also want to say uh, in my experience uh, is that uh, it is, we, we take it more as our barrier, but they don't, if, I mean, uh, as GFK was saying, uh, people here, we all know that they talk so much about weather. So that is a good point to, 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 to start with about weather. And you can start the conversation uh, to, to begin with. The last thing I want to talk about is that these people take pride in the fact that they can do something for you. And if you can identify people in this culture, your neighbors, and ask for help, you can reach them. Let me, let me give you an example. I live in Tele My next neighbor, I think, was a, a kind of a gas mechanic, so he repairs gas, boilers, and things like that. And, uh, but it's not somebody I've never spoken to because if you see his face, he's always frowning, his face, serious man. And you dare not go. And one time, my, my sister was, it was a cold winter. My, my boiler was broken. I, I, I had no, no way of getting in touch with anybody. But I knew that this guy repairs, you know, he goes all the time, he's a private contractor. So the next day, I called him. He quickly ran to the place, repaired the whole thing for me free of charge. He said, next time, come and get it. And he showed me how I could repair it. And so the friendship began that way. If you can actually uh, go to them and say you need something from them, they will become your friend. That's my experience. I would say when I was little, when we went to school, we had assembly every morning for about 20 minutes. They don't do that now. It's multi-faith, as you all know, in school. So there's a bigger challenge on because of that. And one, uh, to say what Joe said there about the, the church, the church here doesn't know the Father God, and they don't know Jesus, and they certainly don't know the Holy Spirit. So when they put their chicken in the oven, it's true, because usually when they come to church, it's a couple of songs, then a little service for 10 to 15 minutes, and then I don't know if they even have a little prayer or something, and then you're home. They don't even have a cup of tea, they don't have fellowship. You know, you come into church a mess and you leave a mess. Very often in this country, you can come into church, nobody even speaks to you. You come in and you, you're desperate, you know, you may be looking for help or looking just for a, a touch or a bit of love or something, you know, and you can leave in a worse mess than you even came in, you know. So this is the reality of the church in this land. And, you know, I will say a few positive things about the African Caribbean and Aberdeen especially. This is a few comments about them. They are closer in their worship to God, you know, because you know how to worship God, you know how to touch God, and you, you know how to throw yourself down and, you know, prostrate before God, etc. In this uh, British culture, you won't see that, you know, and they're like, oh, what's wrong with you, you know, if you do something? So, you know, we have to break through all these barriers. And then also, uh, you're very loving, your love touches people, you know, because you are different, and this is a wonderful breakthrough barrier that we have there. So that's really good. And you're very faithful, you're very consistent, and you're very helpful. And you do, you're very friendly, and you look out for people, you're very loving. And there's always a welcome, you know what I mean? And that does touch the people in this land. Because as we know, we live in a land, I mean, where I live in my little uh, skyscraper, there's about 96 families. And I've always made sure that we all speak to everybody. So I'm like in a little mini village. But in most skyscrapers, it's a nightmare. People don't want to live in them. Because they say, oh my goodness, you don't know who you're going to get for your neighbours. And now, nowadays, nobody talks to each other. Nobody helps each other. You know, at this time of year, all my neighbours get an Easter card with a track in it. 
And the girl on my right hand side, she died uh, just before Christmas and she was only coming up to 30. She was a drug addict anyway on a little bit of methadone and then she went off with her partner's, um, what we'll call it, friend. And then she ended up with him and she, she found out he was a waste of time and he got her drinking. And between taking the drink, etc., she ended up with pancreas trouble. She was in hospital for five months and then she died just on the 27th of December. You know, so there's a mix up, who's gonna empty her house? You know, who's gonna help her? And you know, when I met the guy that's the original father of three of the children, uh, a few weeks ago, I said to him, how are you getting on? Oh, he was screaming and shouting his head off in the street. And I thought, oh my goodness. I said, is anybody helping you? And he said, no. And I said, okay, we'll take the children one day a week and give you a break. You know, pick them up from school, keep them and drop them to you at night. I said, and get a couple hours to yourself. So one week he says to me, I'm going to bed. He said, I'm exhausted. So it's just a little thing like that, you know, just reaching out. And love, of course, conquers all. And of course, prayer. And the great thing is we have the answer because we know how to pray. We know that there is a devil. You see, the people in this land doesn't even know there's a God. Never mind about Jesus or the Holy Ghost. And they don't even know there's a devil and they don't believe it because they're busy watching films, you know, or even cartoons or computer things, you know, with things in it. And they think it's all fantasy and they don't really know that there's a war on, you know, for their soul or anything like that. So at least we know that. So I feel in a way we're blessed because we have the revelation, we have the wisdom, and we have the knowledge. And sometimes we can't tell the person, you know, because I used to always pray with Stella before and bring down, you know, heaven on earth here. And the great thing is we can do that with each other because we're in the same flow. But the whole of this country is not. And, you know, sometimes you'll think, oh, I'm tired, I'm fed up with this. You know what I mean? Why will they not come to our church or why will they not come to our fellowship? You know, but they are watching us, so don't be fooled, you know, and they will come to you because a lot of people don't come to church where I am, but I get a lot of phone calls. Heather, can you pray for me? You know, will you pray for me? Will you do this? Will you do that? Yes, no problem. I don't expect them to come to church because I know the Lord is doing a work in them, and I know in the days to come, they will come because although this is the, the oil capital, you know, it's the oil capital of the Holy Ghost, you know. And I know the real oil from heaven will fall here. And when the money goes, when everything goes from this land, these people need somebody. And we're the ones with the answers. We're the ones that's going to have the money, honey. Amen? Because yes. we're getting it. Hallelujah. It's coming. And we're going to do great things. Amen. Sorry, I'll be quick. Um, there's just a couple of things. Um, about a year ago in our church, we had a forum. You know, it was arranged by the youth. And um, it was looking at the barriers within the church, because our church is big, it just grows and grows and grows. And you lose that kind of personal kind of touch. You know, with smaller churches, you, you, can, you know each other very well. But as it grows bigger, it's difficult to do that through time, through services. So issues that came up were, like earlier I mentioned, you know, people speaking their own language um, you know, whether it's Igbo or, and um, even people from, um, you know, that spoke Yoruba, Hausa, or Igbo, they even says that even within their own tribes, the tribes battle within the church, there's snootiness, there's, so that, you know, so that's within the church itself, never mind coming out to the, you know, the public around us. Also, like how they were saying, Africa, Africa Caribbean is just brilliant. I wouldn't say there was any problems because when I became born again, I knew that when I went back to Church of Scotland, there was something missing. You know, I was dry and I prayed to God, Lord, guide me to somewhere I will go and experience what I felt. And um, within that few weeks, God led me to the ACCF Aberdeen. And... Um, when I went in for praise and worship, I just felt the presence of the Holy Spirit. So I knew that, I knew I was meant to be where I was, you know. So that I know God uses the, the fellowship very well, you know. He, he ministers to people. I've seen how people grow, you know, ups and downs that happen in life, but you still see the body of Christ pulling together. So, um, you know, I thank God for the fellowship. We thank you. Uh, the floor now. Praise God. I really thank, I thank
thank God for such a time like this. I'll give you my experience uh, regarding um, evangelizing in this area too. Uh, where we come from, Africa, you see, we come with this gym, 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 gym. And everywhere you go, you want to gym, gym, gym. And it doesn't work in this environment. First thing, I'll put it, I'm not a pastor, but I'll put it in the place of work where we evangelize. The first thing the Scottish people look at you or the British look at you is your countenance and how you behave. Are you able to live up to what you speak? I'll give you the experience in my place of work. Don't think you can go and say, you want to born again, you need to born again. They'll just laugh at you. All right, you're spiritual. They look at your life. You're hungry. You're shouting. You're doing like that. You go nowhere. You go nowhere to eat. I'll give you, my, in my own department, they know, and I'll give you these examples in my department. Um, I've been, I was working with my colleague once. This is very recent. And um, she wanted to get rid of a lot of operations. We have about 20 to do. So I went and opened another theater and said, look, go and do into that theater while I finish into this theater. Oh, you're telling me to do this? Can it? Can it? Why are you telling me to do this? I smiled. What I'm trying to say is that let your life befit what you say. Once you stand that stand, they know what you have. And once you launch into them, they will come. What, they were trying to gossip about what nurses and doctors and the staffs and male and female do in the theater. And I said, what were you saying about? They said, no, you are going to church this Sunday. We can't hear. You're not supposed to hear what we are saying. You see, I'm, you, you, you've placed yourself in a place that when they need help, some of them will be run to you. Sorry to say, one of the nurses' sons committed suicide, jumped up from a fence, from a flyover down, and committed suicide there, there too. And she was crying. And you were coming to me, what will I do? I said, me, I'm going to pray. So you set your stage in a place that when you penetrate into it, you will do. And for the pastors, I agree. For me, it's 30 minutes sermon, I'll be awake. 45 minutes, I'll sleep. Next five minutes, I snore. I'm going to snore. Because if you can't communicate in 30 minutes, what are you going to give again? And on a Sunday morning, some of them are 80 years old. They, you want to, their memory is gone. And you want to start preaching for them for one hour. They sleep. If you can't communicate a word in 30 seconds, a sermon in 30 seconds, and, sorry, 30 minutes, I don't mean 30 minutes, then, you see, you want to give 20 points in one hour. In Africa, they will do it. You will give it 20 hours. Hmm. No, sorry, I'm mean, one hour, two hours. No. Cut it short to tell them. Then gradually, can, in fact, at times, if, it's so, if the sermon is so exciting in 30 minutes, they will not want you to stop. They will not want you to stop. But you just stop. Even if they don't want you to stop, tell them the next time they will come, next time they will come. So try and come. And we Africans, we don't communicate very well. We want to communicate very long way and we scatter things like that too. So that is my experience and that's the way I'm penetrating into Scottish people. So in the clinic, in my hospital, they know me. Yeah. But I've never, they've never seen me carry the Bible. But they know that there are maybe, uh, what I want to see in the Bible there is, one of the clear was asking me, how do I know this Bible? I'll tell her this year in this Bible. But how do I know it? I said, well, if you read, it's what, so much more you will know. So that is the way to do it. I mean, we should not go ourselves and do that. Thank you. This, wow. Where is the MC? Who is the MC? Uh, please. The floor is bursting with questions and, or contributions. Uh, use your discretion. I think at this stage, the, uh, we would like to have the opportunity to answer a few questions. Then, if at the end we have a bit more time, maybe if you have a very specific contribution which you think no one has covered, we'll give you that opportunity. Okay. And I think so that we give opportunity to everybody, we want to make it as short as possible. I know Father can put her hands up right at the beginning, so I'm going to give you the opportunity. If you just come to the forward and it's quite quickly. I, I'm in a very unique position. As being born in Scotland and being of African descent. So if you want to ask me about, I've been brought up with white people most of my life and I didn't meet black people until I was an adult. So I've been forced to go forward and meet other Africans and learn about their culture. And then I've spent the last 20 years defending the African culture to my white friends. And also been treated as an African or as a black person. So I've been affected by racism from the white people. But I've also been affected by racism from the African people. Because when I say to them I'm African, they say, no, you're not, you're British. So. I am in this unique position right in the center. So if you want to know the best way to address uh, white Scottish people, then you need to talk to me. 
Because <laughs> I am the bridge. I am the bridge. And it's, it's, uh, it's important. And I think that is my role. And uh, I would like to offer myself to the churches because I am a speaker in my other life as a poet and I'm a good communicator. And, um, you know, it's something I really want to do. I really want you to come to me to ask because, as he said, I can't remember who it was, that the approach is to be slow, is slow. Because what I find about Africans, with, even within myself, is they go too fast. They expect you to know everything about the Bible. You feel judged if you don't know where uh, Jacob is or, or how many parables there are or how many books are in the... You know, like, I'm always the last to find my place in the Bible and everybody else is already at Numbers and in Deuteronomy and I'm, I have no idea where it is and I'm like, oh my goodness, they must think I'm a terrible Christian because I don't know where, this, where these passages are. But, so that's why I'm saying... Um, go, go more slowly and ask them they love cups of tea ask them what it is about them learn from them they like food they like to be taken slowly they like to be seen to be liked that you like them and that um, I'm through and actually asking them to learn about who they are and what they like and what they do so that they want to be able to teach it's a two way thing and I think that's what's really important it's a two way thing I, I think apart from contribution, we actually want questions to the panel, you know, we want some questions to the panel. So, yeah, I know you, I will give you the opportunity to have your contribution, but can I just have questions to the panel, please, so that we can actually tease a few things out of them. Okay, let me just see how many people have a question right now, just to have an idea. Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, okay. What we are going to do, I'm going to give you just one question. So we start from here. She said to ask. The question is, um, my experience has been um, more on the fact of how to give to the Scottish. Uh, because to be honest, I think it's a British problem. When you give something, there's always like an apologetic, no, you shouldn't have, you know. Um, that seems to be the response. And it's, it's yeah, uh-huh. So essentially, um, as has been pointed out already, in terms of helping out, they're, they're quick to do it. But when it's the other way around, I think there's an awkwardness. You know, there's, they're kind of embarrassed uh, to get help. So how do you think we can go up to, how, how can we go about this? without causing offense, because that's something I found quite difficult. Even, um, even within the church, I found, when you, when you give, you know, they, they seems to be a, you know, they receive with apology, if that's the word. understand why myself, why they find it embarrassing to be, uh, but I think it comes from, from the, the work ethic and the, the Kirk church, where you, it was drum, it's drummed into British people that you've got to serve God and you've got to give, and giving is better than receiving. So, so they don't, somehow don't think they deserve it, that they shouldn't be helped that they, they shouldn't be given, that you don't know them, so why are you giving them something? So they're also suspicious, and they think if you give them something, they'll have to give you something back. And they, they always think they've got to do something back for you. They can't take something for nothing because they'll think that you'll talk about them because, oh, I did that for her, and now she hasn't done anything for me. So there's an expectation from the other white colleagues that if they do something for that colleague, they'll give something back. So they find it very hard that somebody's just opened their hearts and give, give to them. And it's, it's, it's such an unnatural thing that they're not used to it. So, pardon? Okay, okay. I, Heather, have you got anything to add to that point, briefly? Keep giving, even if they do that, because it is a British thing. 
But the thing is, that is changing because we're living in a culture where there's more cute things, there's more unusual things, and people are starting to give things and receive things. And you still always get a shock when you get something like, oh, thank you very much or something. But at the same time, if we are getting better at receiving it. So I, w I would keep going. Amen. Okay, so they should come. Okay. Just, just a sentence so we can have another question. Okay. Praise God. Um, I think even from white people, their own people were suspicious of uh, receiving. Like if a stranger gave me something, I'd be like, well, what are they after? You know, that is just part of who they are, I think. But in general, when you're giving, you do, it doesn't have to be like a physical gift. It can be your time. You know, just spending time counselling, you know, just pop in, say hello, and build up friendship. I, I think I made a comment earlier. One of the strengths of uh, that, that we, advantage we have is that if you ask them of something, I, I mentioned that. So they are suspicious of receiving things from us, but they are quite happy to give to you. So if you have a need, maybe it's a shovel, you need to know. Maybe it's a, it's a help to push your car. If you ask for a help, they feel that you love them, and we can use that one to our advantage. Okay, we're going to move on to another question. Uh, you put up your hand. Can we have your, you come forward to ask your question? Okay. Well, my question is simple. Some of the teachings in the Bible contradicts the culture here, and we are used to saying, don't do this, don't do this, do it this way, do it this way. How will a Brit feel if they tell him his culture is wrong and he should abandon it immediately and do something else? I, I don't think any, in any, any wise evangelist will tell anybody that your culture is wrong, stop it and do this immediately. I think it's a very slow process. And as you take the person through discipleship to the Bible slowly, they will discover the right culture for, for themselves. In fact, uh, sometimes people equate the Bible with African. This is African thing. Instead of saying it's a Bible thing. But as you take them through the Bible slowly, they will know the difference between the Bible thing and the cultural thing. It, I mean, we Africans also have our cultural problems. Thank you. answer to that question, I think it depends on the church. Because if they're born again, you see, a lot of people don't know what born again is. And then they're scared. They think, oh my God, they're weird. What is born again, you know? And I always give the little story about how Jesus went, you know, in, in John 3 and knocked on the door and, and Nicod to see Nicodemus, sorry, Nicodemus and Jesus on J John 3 and how he kept saying, you must be born again. So what I do is I say, listen, it's quite easy. You know, I said, they looked at Nicodemus up and down. He looked at Jesus. And Nicodemus says, but Jesus, how can I fit into my mother's womb? Look at the size of me. I would burst it. You know, and I said, you have to see it like this. It's not a physical thing. It's a spiritual thing. So really it depends on the church if they're spiritual or if they're not. Because really, once you're a, a citizen of heaven, you don't have any traditions. You don't have any culture. You're just a, a, a king's kid. So it's renewing your mind, isn't it? I think we have one question from, from uh, a white lady. To, <laughs> or Pat. Okay. If you come forward. This, this is a question for Heather, really. You were un ordained under a black church. Would you consider black cover again? <laughs> okay. Abra uh, Eugene? Yes. You're going to make a contribution. Okay. Uh, yes, I'm, I'm just. Yeah, let's have a question. Then after that, we have. We have one question from him, a question from our brother here, a contribution that uh, Reverend will round everything off for us. Yes. So, praise the Lord. 
Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the mighty Jesus. Hallelujah. As I was sitting down there, uh, the Holy Spirit told me that uh, I should raise an issue in between the children of God here. Yeah. And then that issue easily go to our Papa here. That uh, there should be a prayer concerning this country. The leadership of this country. The reason why I try to listen to know what the God is, you know, try to tell me. Uh, I used to watch a, a Christian program, news, on the KICC, something like that. And then the, the issue just happened recently. Uh, a foster woman in this country, there in Leeds, she took her a little girl. So the little girl grown up came from an Islamic uh, other religious. And then uh, through the process, the foster woman, she's a you know, born again Christian. So she go her own church as they live together. And then uh, the little girl, which become uh, a teenager, and teenager can choose whatever they like in this country. And then uh, through that process, she used to see the woman go to church, read the Bible, and so, so, so things like that. So what I want to put out there, what I want to bring out there, is all about this issue now turn to this girl's life. That the girl now went to the church. The woman didn't force her to turn or to convert an Islamic religion or doing things like that to the Christian way. But now, the support worker that's in care of that little girl before you know, she can choose whatever she wants, now see the little girl become a teenager girl now, turns to a Christian. And the little girl now said, she will prefer the word of God, which they say is Jesus Christ. That she believes Jesus Christ, she read the word, and she knows the difference between Quran and what, uh, the Bible. So what happened? She met the woman. She, you know, have a chat with her and said, she want to be baptized as Jesus Christ was baptized when she was 12. And after doing that, the social worker people now sue this woman. The case is in court at the right now, which they postponed to April 24. If that woman get judged for the sake of Jesus Christ, all the Christianity are in shame. Because of a one soul, she may go to jail for that. And the government in this land allow that. In Africa, you can choose whatever. A Muslim man can change to a Christian way. May God help us. I would like daddy to try, even not to try, to, to put this I issue on prayer. God bless you. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, I think we're running out of time. That was not really a question. Uh, I think the, the point he really wants is for us to pray that that girl is not a prison. In this country, it's against the law to leave a child in the house itself. So if the mama is the foster mother and she's going to church, you cannot leave that child. You have to bring that child to where you're going. Now, if the child makes its own decision, that's fine. That's the free will of the child. So in a way, the foster mother is quite correct to bring her to church. She never forced her to be a Christian, but because she's leaving her house, she could actually get done for leaving the child in the house. So we must pray that she wins the case. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. Because of time, um, there are just two uh, uh, points we pursue. We are give our brother the opportunity to make his conviction, then uh, Reverend, we actually round up the session for us. Um, when you're having your dinner, your tea, you could have opportunity to speak to the panelists and ask Reverend your questions as well. 
Um, I just feel a, a sense of freedom in here just now, which is something in my church. I go to a Baptist church, evangelical, um, but uh, I just feel so, so free just now. So praise the Lord. God is good all the time. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Give glory to God. It says in the word, where two or three are gathered, there am I in the midst. The Lord's here today. He's been here since yesterday. He's here right now, and he's going to be with us for the rest of the weekend, right? Amen. I just want to share with you, and it really, really fascinates me, how that many of you from Africa, Nigeria, uh, Guana, wherever, it fascinates me so much that you really, really do know the Word of God inside out. You really, really do. That's a challenge to me. It really, really is. And I am so, so fascinated with that fact. It stirs my spirit. It really, really does. If I come into an African or Caribbean church or whatever, I'm so, so challenged. You know, and I think, I think we Scots, we, I think we're ashamed to get to know our Word more and more, you know, and, you know, we really, really do need the Word of God for our lives, because it's a tool at the end of the day for any situation, and we should really, really know the Word of God. And the other great thing is, uh, that I like about uh, the African, Caribbean, uh, Guana, Church, or whatever, what I like is, when, when you, Ghana, sorry, when you pray, for someday, you pray for somebody with conviction, you and faith. Yeah, exactly, sister. You pray with conviction. <clears throat> you help that person. You really stand by that person. You understand, and there's a great confidentiality there. That speaks to me because there are many people who I've spoke to, who I've maybe trusted, and they went and spoke behind my back about something personal in my life. That's not how God works. When we came to God as Christians, He understood everything. He knows all about us. He knows all the personal things in our lives. And I think that's an important fact to take a hold of. God's, yeah, but, you know, God's not going to be the person to speak behind your back. Men will let you down because we're so full of flesh. But I praise God for the African church. Uh, I praise God for the work and the spirit uh, the way the Spirit's taking control of your lives and the way that the Spirit is. Praise God and thanks for your help. Thank you. Yeah, I also want to thank God for the a Church of Scotland because the vision of the ACCF in Aberdeen for about a year, going to two years now, it is to, we are looking at how to reach out. And uh, what God has actually done in our lives is that we have paired up with the Church of Scotland and we are reaching out to them. That is actually a good thing yeah. because that's why the name also, we appreciate the African Caribbean Fellowship because when they hear that we are coming to their churches, they know we are coming with fire. And they know that there will be an impartation. So we really, I really appreciate what, how the Church of Scotland is now open to receive what we can do to help them know God more. Praise the Lord. Now, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, you really have to clap for these panelists. Because I took them by surprise. We never discussed anything. I just wanted them to throw away academics and be real. And that can only come when you surprise them. Then they can tell us what is on their heart. And God bless you. It's, 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 been, it's been wonderful. Thank you. Everybody blow your trumpet.